today, Jonas and I are talking to John Belisarios. John is Managing Director and Global CBDC Lead at Accenture. And Accenture is involved in many digital assets and CBDC projects around the world, such as Sweden and the US. Today, John shares with us his insights and learnings from these projects. Welcome everyone to this episode of Bitcoin, Fiat and Rock and Roll. We have a very special guest today and this is uh, John Valisarios from Accenture. And I will actually hand right over to Jonas who is going to introduce uh, John to you today. Thanks, Alex. So, um, yeah, John is a managing director in Accenture's technology consulting workforce based in London. So uh, most of them, I'm sure, might already know John. And um, John is also Accenture's global blockchain and multi-party systems lead, also thereby being responsible for digital assets, custody and central bank digital currencies, a topic we will um, yeah, definitely dis discuss in detail today. And I think why John is really an excellent guest is um, because he, um, together with uh, Accenture, of course, is currently um, leading several blockchain engagements with really top tier global organizations and central banks. So, John, it's really a pleasure to, to have you here. And we are really looking forward to the discussion with you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So to get started, you, I think you have a very interesting Vita. So you basically started, uh, yeah, started with studying computer science. And back then, then you worked uh, most of the time in consultancy, but you were also co-founder and CEO of a blockchain startup in 2014. So maybe, John, um, you can tell us um, basically how did your blockchain and digital asset journey start and what was driving your decision to found a crypto company back in 2014, which was definitely quite early, I would say. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I, and thank you for you know for those questions because I think they are very important and foundational questions to understand maybe where the market is going and then everything else around that. And I, from my from a personal experience, it was a, a very um, a, a critical part of my career where I actually stepped out of the firm. Uh, I took a leave of absence from Accenture for a year, and I joined a Bitcoin wallet company called Armory. Um, to help build out uh, the capabilities of, of, of that, uh, or, you know, of that uh, platform. And uh, I, I found it immensely valuable. And the reason why I did it um, goes back even probably several years before that, um, when I, I actually studied cryptography in computer science. I worked for many years in, in the industry and, and also spent a lot of time in payments. And when I came across Bitcoin, um, initially I was, I, it's, it looked interesting, but I, but I had also seen other type of digital cash and payment schemes, and I didn't pay enough attention to it at the time um, uh, when it came out. Uh, but a couple of years later, of course, I was approached to, to, um, to join this Bitcoin wallet company, and I, I found it a, an incredible opportunity that I couldn't pass up because of all of the stuff that I had done before, but also the potential that it showed and, um, and, and how it would potentially transform the future of money. And that's why I, I sort of leaped, took the leap, uh, a leap of faith, and I, I jumped out of the firm for, for a bit of time um, uh, and, and, and joined the company. And, uh, um, and, and then while I was there, of course, I ended up um, uh, discovering a whole bunch of new things that, that helped me shape the future of, of where I would go afterwards, and, and especially in the CBDC space as well. So, so John, and then as I understand, you came back to Accenture after after this uh, short outside job, and now you're the global CBDC lead of Accenture. And I would be really yeah. interested uh, when this when this started. So, when did Accenture take the decision to yeah deal with this topic and actually create a position that is dedicated purely to to CBDC? And maybe you can say a couple of words about what, what your day to day job looks like at Accenture. Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, it, it sort of all happened by accident, actually. And when I was in my sort of uh, uh, in my startup, I I was uh, working, um, of course, on my uh, on, on the business of the of, of that I was developing. Um, but at the same time, I also kept in touch with a lot of my colleagues from Accenture. And an opportunity came up uh, where we sort of presented to a central bank this topic of cryptocurrencies. And um, and that was sort of the beginning of the journey, really. Um, and um, they were very interested in it because of um, uh, of the effect that it could have. Um, and 
we ended up selling an engagement there, which lasted over a year. And I, when I returned back to Accenture, I ended up delivering it. And that was Accenture's first blockchain project. And it was definitely the first central bank digital currency project. Mm. And from there, which, which it, it year sort was of, that, John? Uh, oh boy, um, <laughs> 2015, I believe. Um, okay. Yeah, so 16, <laughs> something early. like that. So yeah, it was quite early. It was very early um, in in that whole process. And and we ended up um, um, we ended up delivering. I ended up delivering that for a year. It was a fantastic experience. Um, and 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 I saw what I saw in in sort of the cryptocurrency world. I saw also in the CBDC world. And I ended up pushing and pushing to do more and more of these engagements. And we ended up obviously doing the work with the, with other central banks um, and, and establishing sort of um, uh, quite a presence and, and doing it over and over again. And, and, and by de facto, it ended up becoming sort of a CBDC practice that, 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 we, that people started paying attention to and both in the marketplace, but also within the firm. Um, and I found myself at ground zero, having shaped those engagements from the very start with a, with a team of people that also believed in the same um, ideals and ideas that we had in uh, developing this uh, for the future. And that was sort of the, the beginning of it. And it was a quite, a, a quite a specialized area. I mean, I would look at sort of Accenture, you know, is, is focused on many, um, many aspects of financial services, transformation and technology and so on. And here were these bunch of guys that were doing stuff in CBDC, and all of a sudden, you know, that that's also an area where very few people had any experience in. And central banks, by definition, are, you know, there it's quite difficult to to sort of get into and, and work um, on those kind of projects. But given the nature of what the transformation of money um, could uh, could enable. That's where sort of we, we we clearly made a mark for ourselves and we established ourselves uh, pretty early on and continue to do so through engagements and work and projects that we're delivering. Yeah, and I think at least from what we know today, it seems to pay off that you decided to engage so early into these uh, projects and topics because I would say Accenture is one of the leading consultancies, at least in the CBDC space, maybe even in the in the crypto space uh, globally. So I, as I understand, you're invested or engaged in, in several CBDC projects like the Digital Dollar with the Digital Dollar Foundation. I think you're uh, in Sweden. Now you have Correct. a couple of days ago published this paper together with a Swift and cross-border CBDC payment. So I read Accenture um, everywhere when I, when I read articles about CBDCs. Can you maybe tell us a couple of words about maybe your one or two most interesting or exciting projects you're currently doing globally? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I mean, they're all exciting and they're all interesting in their own right. So I have to admit that, you know, picking favorites is always a very difficult thing um, <laughs> <laughs> because they are all, they all have a very different facet of what they're trying to, uh, what, what, you know, what we're trying to do in the projects. Um, the ones that I, I find the, the most interesting, though, I have to admit, are the ones that have a very long term view with the intent to actually do something quite transformational. And I think that's where, um, you know, working on these in, these projects and engagements really, really sort of helps um, shape the future direction and vision of money and how uh, financial services could potentially be transformed. So Sweden is a fantastic example. Um, we spent a lot of time even before being awarded the work uh, and spent time in the delivery of the work. Um, and I think the, you know, the Swedish economy is, is not, it's not a, a massive one like, like the U.S. is, but at the same time, um, it's a, is a fantastic sort of lighthouse for how, um, you know, a very well studied, well thought through sort of initiative like the e-krona Uh, could potentially go, um, and and I think you know we're we're hitting, you know, all the great challenges head on, um, and learning, uh, both learning and and delivering as well, with uh, with the client and and trying to understand sort of the transformational effect of money and and um, and and how it could affect users, uh, uh, consumers rather, and, um, and 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 so on. I think other projects like the digital dollar is also extremely interesting because of its size i would say the mm -hmm. potential for uh you know several thousand financial institutions in the us with multiple federal reserve banks and a global reserve currency 
Um, that's about as big as it gets uh, in terms of complexity. And, and I think just managing the the conversation, let alone a, you know a project to deliver uh, CBDC, is is hard enough. Um, and the dialogue that needs to happen is through, um, and that's what we're doing, obviously through the public-private partnerships, but also through the, the use cases and the experiments that we're that we're developing, and also the investment that we're making as well. I think we see this as the future, and we're not afraid to also invest our time, money, energy, effort, um, and, and into it to help shape the future, be part of the future. And that's really where I think, you know, our, our firm not only is involved in delivery, uh, of course, and, and, and projects and, and, um, uh, and so on, but also in helping invest in the future ourselves. And, and we have a vested interest, all of us have a vested interest that, that, it, that it's done right. Um, and, and that's why we try to bring the best of all the learnings from everywhere um, into those engagements. And I think that that helps us immensely to structure and shape uh, the future direction of, of these engagements. So those are a couple other projects, I would say, but there's many more and there's more coming as well. So I'm not public, uh, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, you know, and I'm very excited and they all have very unique uh, features themselves. And, and Sean, maybe one question from my side, are you basically allowed to, to tell us how, how many engagement you have in the CBDC space without, of course, revealing all the names? Do you uh, get a feeling this is tough? <laughs> Uh, it's a tough, a tough one because yeah, <laughs> because of the well. Let's just say that we have s several more uh, coming, uh, and they will be announced in due time. Um, you know, as, as okay, that's so good clients, to hear. <laughs> clients, clients will 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 you know talk about it, no doubt. I think the interesting thing about many of the CBDC projects are um, is that many of them are are. Um, They're, op they're quite open uh, about, um, you know, some of the announcements. Of course, they have to manage, you know, obviously the messages that they deliver to the market and central banks, uh, you know, are, are uh, very sensitive to that, uh, not to sort of, uh, uh, sort of, you know, signal to the market things that they're not comfortable with. So, so uh, but they do talk about it. It is a very sort of open community and um, there is a lot of discussion going on and, and, Many many of the things that we're involved in have an open um, open sort of uh, perspective towards the market about the, about it. So, John, can you maybe share a couple of information on what what Accenture's role is usually in these kind of projects? So, I understand there are central banks involved, of course. Then it's Accenture, mm -hmm. sometimes also also other partners. And maybe what are the the main challenges you're us usually facing uh, along these CBDC projects in particular? Yeah. Um, so uh, our role is, um, I guess, delivery partner, strategic thinkers, depending on the type of project that it is as well. I mean, I, I, if, if we look at um, some projects, it's really about strategy, vision, direction, um, and helping shape, uh, helping shape that. Uh, other projects involve uh, implementation. So taking sort of a lot of the thinking and then implementing it into something that we can conceptualize uh, uh, and then use as a way to validate uh, thinking and assumptions. Other ones are more towards implementation for the intent of production. Um, we are a technology agnostic company. We don't have product ourselves. I think that's one of the strengths that we have as a, as a firm. So we look at the problem, um, you know, not look at it from a, from a technology specific uh, position. We try to understand requirements uh, as much as we possibly can very early on to help shape what it is that we try to sort of direct, you know, our, our central bank clients towards. Um, and, and we see a number of things developing in the market that uh, allow us to shape that um, quite effectively. Like sort of, for instance, the, I talk about sort of optimal configurations. That means sort of looking at, you know, the stakeholders, the two tier banking uh, system, um, you know, what's, what does it mean from a, a cash usage from a consumer point of view, tokenized cash usage, or is it a token, is it an account, all these different things to consider. Um, I mean, there's multiple facets to it. And we look at all of these points as part of any project uh, to help shape uh, the delivery of it. Projects themselves, like, uh, for instance, in, in, in uh, Sweden, are multi-year projects. And there are implementation projects uh, to actually build it um, build a solution uh, to demonstrate that it can work, and you know, and then we can, and that it meets all the, the requirements and 
functional and non-functional requirements uh, of the solution but that uh, that would allow a, an implementation uh, the ultimate decision is all you know is really left with uh, the central bank to determine whether they want to go ahead and, and pursue it and implement it put it in practice a lot of that requires legislative change policies stakeholder management um, and so on then all those are very complex topics now keep in mind central bank money you know exists today in only two forms in digital form it lives in a reserves you know in a yeah, um, uh, uh, in the reserve accounts of a central bank in, di in digital form where where commercial banks have access to it in you know, our TGS platform and it lives in banknotes and coins um, and and that is a and that's it and, and so what we're talking about is a new format of money and in a digital format of this money and that hasn't that hasn't uh, been developed the last time the banknotes came out was thousands of years ago so this is a new format of money as we know it um, and today, digital money lives only in the commercial bank world. It doesn't live in the central bank world. So apart from, you know, reserve accounts, as I mentioned before. So this is quite different. And taking sort of everyone along for that journey is, is not a not a simple uh, undertaking. Yeah. So, so as you said, John, I mean, CBDC are indeed a, a new form of money. And what I mean, it could be, of course, very disruptive in the end. But what do you personally think? What are the, the most important use cases for a CBDC? So why basically do we need it from your um, your perspective? As we as you said, we already do have digital money today on, on our bank accounts and also in form of central banks reserves for, for banks. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, um it's a very good question, actually, and it's also part of the dialogue as well that we have. Um, why do we need it? Commercial bank money exists today, digital money, and people are, you know, using it. Um, and and most people wouldn't even know the difference between central bank money and commercial yeah. bank money if you ask them. Um, and so, uh, so th that's also part of the education, of course, that that needs to happen. But um, I think in in sort of uh, simple terms, if you look at it from a you know. Uh, uh, there's, you know, retail applications, there's wholesale applications, and there's cross-border applications of, of central bank um, you know, CPDC. In the wholesale space, you see digital assets developing um, that are that are quite uh, digital asset um, issuance platforms, exchanges, and so on that are developing and are quite, uh, uh, I would say, sort of uh, advanced. And they need a format of settlement that is equivalent to the to the nature of the digital assets in order to you know reduce risk in those kind of delivery versus payment transactions uh, so basically CBDC john if i may, may interrupt you here yeah. uh, sorry a, a settlement basically without an intermediary in the end right to really correct. exploit also delivery versus payment correct exactly so to, so without an intermediary and enabling sort of that atomic swap uh to happen in a risk-free environment and central bank money provides that element of risk freeness uh, of, of uh, the transaction in retail applications, it's a little bit more complicated, and some of the projects that we've looked at, um, you know, you could argue that most consumers wouldn't even know the difference. Uh, but at the same time, the reasons why some countries have been looking at this is really as a uh, to enable, um, uh, you know, the usage of cash and payments between consumers and each other at a time of a national crisis and time of a national emergency when electricity goes off the net internet goes down in a time of crisis um that that uh today if if all of the money is in doesn't if all of the money is electronic and is not um is not available to consumers then how do they end up paying each other and so can you imagine a scenario where you're you're operating in an entirely digital uh, uh financial market and then all of a sudden everything goes offline. Uh, what happens then? Uh, you can probably exist. You know, you can probably have minimal impact if it's an hour. You know, half a day. A day would be probably very disruptive. But then beyond that, what happens? And I think this is also part of the challenge in in our increasingly digital world. The other aspect to consider is that, you know, for today, I you know I can I can make uh, a cash payment if I need. I have a bank note in my pocket. I can give it to you. But I cannot do that digitally anymore. In an increasingly digital world, I have to rely on intermediaries um, in order to, to do that. Now, if I can transact that uh, directly um, in a digital world, that also opens up a you know a whole host of new opportunities that we never you know never imagined before. And I think that's also an area where it would make perfect sense to look at uh, it from a retail perspective. Um, 
and so on. There's a number of use cases and, and, and so on. But the biggest area, I think, is really in the cross-border space where there's a tremendous amount of friction. Uh, friction in terms of time, friction in terms of cost, a lot of intermediaries involved in the process. Um, and, and today, if I want to send money uh, directly to somebody overseas or to another country, it is quite difficult. Uh, I can do that through intermediaries quite easily, but I can't do that directly in central bank money. And I think the opportunities are are, are plenty uh, for for that whole space to enable um, a wealth of new type of transactions to take place. Uh, and and it and it just re it re sort of um, formats the financial marketplaces. I think and, and I think CBDC uh, in a multi CBDC environment would create a tremendous amount of opportunities for all of us. John, what about the use case anonymity? Because my my approach to, and I also, I, I think this is a very, very uh, difficult question to answer, even though it's the most obvious one. Why do we need retail CBDCs? But I think it's really difficult to answer. And my approach to answering it is always, let's look what's already out there and what has been solved, which problems have been solved by the private sector. And two yeah. things that have not been solved by the private sector today is one thing you have mentioned, offline, digital offline payments. And yeah. the second thing is anonymous payments. So do you think yeah. this could be a use case for a CBDC as well? I think so. Uh, the anonymous part of it, I think, um, creates a lot of, uh, I guess, creates a lot of open questions, right? About sort of AML, KYC. Do you want to enable all of this uh, for consumers to make anonymous payments in a digital way in a much more efficient manner than ever before? Today, you're somewhat. If you want to make a pure, truly anonymous payment, you basically have, you know, you're, you're resulting to cash. And that is that that has its own physical limits, right? So, so it's ar it's already ar it's already physically limited in terms of the level of uh, transactions that you can perform. Um, of course, you know, with all the all the right caveats in place. So, in a digital world, I think uh, a degree of anonymity is going to be required um, because I, I also don't think that you should be creating massive databases of people's, you know, transactions and data and everything else that goes with it. And I think it needs to it needs to have a sense that people's privacy uh, is being preserved in the right way, um, and and the anonymity dimension I think is a very important one, with limits I think with or within limits, and there are ways to model it right. I think there's a lot of clever people um, around think, thinking about all these different things, and there are ways that we those can be addressed uh, again within limits that make sense for. For um, for consumers, now I think that the other other thing to also consider is that in some markets, in some countries, in some economies, anonymity is you know one of the top requirements that we see in CBDC. In other ones, however, it isn't, um, and so I, I see anonymity and privacy for transactions vary uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but it will be one of the key. Uh, criteria where it's a where it's a an important facet for the, the you know uh, determining whether they go you go ahead and implement something like that. So I, th I think um, we need to have answers to the, the anonymity and privacy uh, problem, um, and, and and they need to be aligned to sort of what the consumers and end users will expect. Otherwise, they will just not adopt it, and I think it will have its own limitations as well. Yeah, I also agree, John. And I thought it was really interesting when the ECB published the results of its consultation on the digital euro that also per jurisdiction, it was asked how important is privacy. And here, Germany, for example, was really leading with, I think, almost 60 percent of uh, people surveyed basically um, stressing the importance of privacy. And then we had also some other countries, as, for example, Spain and Italy, with just, I think, t between 10 and 20 percent people really um, voting for privacy. So I think um, I really agree with you that this in, in the end is a jurisdictional um, a jurisdictional approach, however, of course, being really essential also for for CBDC implementation in the end. Uh, implementation Correct. in the end. Correct. Um, from 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 the question about the use cases, I, I've kind of may have heard that um, it seems that you um, also vote or would vote for a CBDC that is basically based on an, or has a, has a token based design and is also issued on a on a DLT. And this reminded me also when I read the publication, for example, about the digital dollar project which also outlines um, why um, they vote for a token-based CBDC. Um, so is this conclusion from my side uh, correct? And if so, which advantages do you think that uh, such DLT-based token would bring in the end? 
Yeah, this is, th thank you. This is an endless debate. <laughs> we have a lot of talk of discussion about this. <laughs> I and, can imagine, uh, yeah. I, I can, and um, we have taken a very a house view uh, very early on, right, uh, about tokens versus account. Um, and, and I'm sure if you listen to a lot of our podcasts, there's a lot of the, uh, and, and sort of web, and sort of the, the webinars that we run as well, we have a lot of um, uh, people challenging us on this topic as well. So I think it's also uh, very interesting because I, I think our, well, first of all, we have a, our view is that token, the tokens provide the level of innovation that's needed. I think uh, accounts, we have accounts today, we can do a lot of things with accounts, no doubt. Um, and there's there's always obviously an argument that you can make a lot of these things look like the other. You can make accounts look like tokens, and tokens look like accounts from a functionality point of view, and so on. But up, apart from all of that, if you're just purely looking at the innovation that we're talking about, the 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 token is where we believe the innovation lies. The, the ability to have a value bearing uh, digital token, an instrument that can move both the value and the ownership at the same time. Uh, without sort of you know an intermediary being necessary being pre being present and necessary, and again you can you can argue a lot of points around that. I think is really where the innovation lies, and and similar similar to a you know pushing a physical banknote across a table when you're making a settlement right a payment, um, and I think that's where uh, we see a lot of the uh, of the innovation. Uh, being created for the future of financial markets, but also for consumers as well. Um, and it comes with a lot of other challenges um, also. And I think that's also part of the part of the uh, problem because you have to deal with, you know, how do you protect it? How do you, you know, hold it, manage it, and do all the necessary things to to secure it as well. Um, but that that's where I think that, and we have a, and if I look at some of the papers as well that we've, that we've uh, we have a champion model um, that captures all of the, I guess, the best attributes that we would expect to see in this new format of money. And tokens, uh, for us, has a very high position there. And, and um, we, we see that, um, you know, others are challenging it with other type of model, models and, and account-based models and so on. All good. It's part of the, it's part of the debate and the dialogue. Um, but, but clearly, uh, you know, we're very fond of token-based solutions um, for, the, for obvious reasons. So, so John, is one reason why you are favoring tokens maybe that you could use this money then in blockchain or DLT applications or environments? Uh, I, I think the tokens, um, the way to implement tokens is through DLT environments and blockchain environments, right, at the end of the day. So uh, I think it's it's not the reason for... We, we don't favor tokens because of the DLT. We favor tokens because of what they, the functionality they provide, and they happen to be implementable through DLT and blockchain applications. So it's it's not because of the technology, it's because of what attributes and, and uh, functionality that it provides is why we sort of favor tokens. Yeah, so, so the reason why I'm asking is because what, what we observe kind of is that the industry, for instance, is at least thinking about using blockchain or DLT for certain value chains or business processes. So mm -hmm. there might be in the future in the industry, um, it might be totally normal to say we have certain processes that run over a blockchain and at mm -hmm. a certain point in time, there is a smart contract which triggers a payment, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's always the question, um, who is kind of how do you settle this payment is it with the existing account based money will it be a token and if it's a token will it be a cbdc or will it maybe be a form of money that is being provided by the by the private sector and i'm, I'm not sure if you have an opinion on this and maybe also then going into the direction of interoperability um right how is this going yeah to no, no, no it's, a, it's a very good point i mean and, and uh sorry i wasn't maybe complete in my answer but i think that you're absolutely right what uh what the, what we see as well is the ability to embed tokens, you know, and, and have smart contracts and have supply chain baked into that, and as well as identity as another dimension to it. And tokens enable um, enable a much more functionally rich environment to operate in. That I think is key for us to be able to capture the the benefits of of, of what we're trying to rearchitect. Um, and I think that that's also part of the story as well. And, and 
the functionality it provides, and I mean, I was very maybe simplistic in my uh, response first, but the function, the rich functionality that it provides more broadly enabled by blockchain and DLT solutions that can do much more than just money at the end. And we do smart contracts and, you know, the supply chain and, and, and all these different um, wonderful things that we can, we can sort of roll together, I think are, are really the sort of the downstream enable uh, uh, the things that will be enabled downstream through tokenized forms of money. So, so in your projects, are you, or in general, is Accenture already thinking about how to solve the issue of interoperability? Because that's kind of one big question I always have, because we will probably yeah. never be able to agree on one blockchain. So there might be industry A, which is using Hyperledger, another one is using yeah. Corda. And then there's, of course, the central bank issuing its uh, CBDC on maybe another, another DLT. And then kind of we have to solve this interoperability issue, right? It's, it's one of the things that keeps me the most up at night, actually, to be honest. And <laughs> <laughs> because, because we are advising, of course, clients and we're building solutions and we, want, we don't want uh, anyone to be left on an island at the end of the day, right? So that, that is absolutely key. You, you have to build something because you've got you to build it at the end of the day. So you have to pick something and, and implement it. And, and, um, and that's where we see sort of the different solutions that are in the market. I too don't agree or don't believe that there will be one that will win them all. And I think that would also be a mistake as well. Um, because I also think that money is a public utility um, and it shouldn't have a vendor flavor. It shouldn't have that sort of dimension to it. I mean, I'm just speaking very broadly, I think, because I think, I, I think there will be more, there's, there is a lot of work that's going on uh, in this area, especially specifically, I guess, in, from an open source perspective and, and initiatives from an open source perspective, there, there are a number of institutions that are looking at interoperability as well. Um, there's a lot of bilateral conversations that are happening between central banks to, to talk about how to deal with things like that. I mean, we even had a project ourselves with Jasper Ubin where we talked about, where we sort of implemented a solution using HTLC now as functional interoperability, not necessarily technical interoperability, but Regardless, I mean, there are many uh, different approaches uh, that are being looked at, and there's in the multi CBDC environment, there will be an, there will be uh, different approaches need to be experimented with to find the optimal one. I don't believe there will be one CBDC platform. I believe there will be many, and they all have to interoperate one way or another. And then there's, a, there's only a couple of ways that you can look at this, and so this those need to be really well thought through. Standards, I think, also play a role, um, and I think there are a number of institutions that are looking to to make a mark on at least on trying to you know to to uh, uh, to deal with things like standards uh, to also address interoperability between these different CPTC implementations. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a never-ending problem, I think, at the end. But we eventually will get to a point, hopefully, where we can translate one uh, token for another in real time without any loss, um, without any sort of, um, so, so, so without any sort of issues and, and making it in a very uh, efficient and effective way, or that there is a sense of interoperability that from a consumer, like I do today, right? So I have a, I mean, I'm, I'll put it in a simplistic way. I have a physical wallet uh, with, banknotes from different countries and my wallet works because it's able to accept most of the banknotes and the sizes of the banknotes that 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 fit into it now if somebody decides to print something that is you know on an a4 sheet that of course won't work um but then you know we have to physically we have to think about interoperability in similar ways maybe there's a way to do address it from a wallet point of view so my wallet will accept tokens issued by multiple central banks and they exist independently of each other, uh, and I can transact with them depending on on on, um, on on my sort of the currency that I'm, I'm transacting, or I I have um, you know other intermediaries that can transfer, translate, or I even have um, sort of a you know more standardized approach that it it's consumable by multiple applications and wallets and so on. So there's multiple ways to look at this. So I think it's also part of the, the fun behind this. This is going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of work and research that has to go into this to, 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 to realize the, uh, to realize the, uh, you know, success at the end. 
For sure, yeah. And I really like the the aspect you just uh, brought up, uh, John, that in the end, and you also mentioned it in the beginning, that the CBDC is really powerful if you can use it easily in the cross-border context. So if people can hold a US CBDC, a Euro CBDC, um, etc. Um, and maybe coming back to this uh, aspect of interoperability, what I'm currently not sure is basically if we have in, in a world, maybe in five or 10 years, we do have all these different CBDCs. Um, who is basically there to ensure, I mean, of course, interoperability, but also the efficient exchange of the one currency into, into the other. I mean, the IMF, for example, did something with like um, with uh, former currency systems, right, as, as pro by providing such a platform. Do you think that this is ba basically something the private sector could do? Or do you also see there a, a public sector institution that could, could govern such an, an infrastructure, if you will? Uh, it's, it's a very, I mean, I, I see a number, potentially a number of entities, a couple, but not many that could, that could play a key role in enabling that, for instance, entities like the BIS uh, and all the innovation hub activities and the projects that they're doing as well would be, I think, um, uh, a clear example of, of, uh, of how that could, how that could play out. Um, in addition to that, uh, you know, I know the IMF has been very active as well in this area, but, uh, but it really requires sort of entities that are connected with multiple central banks, um, driving experiments and projects, learning, sharing, and then helping shape the future direction. Um, and that's where I think there will be a lot more work that has to happen. I think also private entities. Um, if I look at sort of the vendors, the vendors themselves are not incentivized to, to do that. Um, apart from the fact that if they play a bigger role, um, and that, that they can say, look, my our solution is interoperable with another one. Um, but purely, I think, looking at this, you know, objectively, I think it'll have to be driven on the on the vendor space, entities like ourselves that are, you know, working with clients and then our, uh, client organizations like central banks, central banks and other organizations that have a much broader role that, um, you know, convening sort of uh, in multiple central banks to the table uh, which I think is is really, um, you know, it'll, it'll have to be driven on multiple fronts uh, as well in order to get to, a, a, I guess, a conclusion on that. So, John, for the last five to ten minutes, I would like to zoom out a little bit because we have talked a lot about a CBDC today. And uh, you have published an interesting article in January, I believe, this year, um, which was about the evolution or the revolution of money. So I would be interested in your opinion on how CBDC fit into this bigger picture of money and payments in the future. So we are probably going to have CBDC. We also have cryptocurrencies. We have stable coins, something like Tether, USTC, DM, etc. And maybe totally other forms of, of, of payments and money in the future. So do you think they will all coexist with different use cases? Is there one that uh, wins them wins all, or how do you foresee this this playing out? Yeah, I mean, and and that so also goes back to our sort of thinking, my thinking many years ago when I said, oh, you know, all these different cryptocurrencies and all these innovations that are coming up, stable coins and the corporation coins and and utility settlement coins and all the you know the bank consortiums and all that coming together to sort of look at the market and, and trying to carve out a niche for themselves as well. And my initial view of that was that CBDC would, would replace that. In reality, uh, now, now that, now that I, we've learned more than, than before, in reality, I see them coexisting. Um, and everyone has a very unique, has unique properties and features that I think benefit sort of the segments that they're trying to address. Clearly, there's an overlap between many of those, and I think the role, the the role that they've tried to step into was one that could have been served by a CBDC had it been available, but in reality, also addresses different segments of the market. And I take a look at sort of corporation coins that are, you know, the the banks that are trying to issue. What they're trying to do is tokenize their balance sheet and enable sort of their clients to transact throughout their organization, which is global in nature, but within the construct of their organization. DM is is trying to be sort of from a consumer point of view, a, a, you know, an efficient and, and convenient way to transfer value between a, con a community and a user base, again, global, uh, but it's not central bank money. And so they all, they all sort of have a, but they also all paint a tapestry of different types of functionality and they all serve different types of, of users and communities. 
and they play different roles. They also have different attributes in terms of risk and and sort of backing and, and things like that. And I think the market will decide what's appropriate for them. Um, and and I think that's also going to be interesting to see, you know, which ones dominate and play, continue to play a role. And I know that in the crypto world and the tethers and the world and the, the, those things are, 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 are very active and they serve a very valuable purpose. Um, I think, you know, it depends on, on how, how uh, consumers and users sort of um, see the role of CBDC and how functional it is, whether it will, you know, overlap or overtake perhaps in some cases, some of those, uh, some of those uh, areas. Mm. Do you think banks can play a role? Because I mean, besides JP Morgan, who with its JP Morgan coin, banks are pretty passive, let's say when it comes to issuing um, digital form of, of money. And that's, I think, particularly delicate, because if you look at how our, our monetary system works today, the main provider of money or means of payments are actually banks, right, with their commercial bank money. Correct. And now in the future, we see there is a new competitor called CBDC, there is a new competitor called stablecoins, they all kind of trying to, to replace um, send, uh, commercial bank money to a certain extent. So do you think banks have to play a role in, in the future uh, payment system? I think they all been looking at it as well. I mean, many of them have been looking at that. Uh, the big players have, but they have also uh, a different dimension. Like the bigger banks will have uh, a, a massive balance sheet, a global presence, and there is definitely a value in them, in them tokenizing their balance sheet and enabling it for for their customers for you know cross border payments. And I think that um, not all banks will pursue this. Many, I think. Some have, probably more will. Um, I don't see it being as perhaps as pervasive. It depends on really, you know, um, how that sort of what the value case or the business case is for them. It reminds me of sort of, you know, many years ago when banks used to issue their own money directly in the form of banknotes. And I'm sure you probably you know, remember or you've probably seen that. Um, it's a similar sort of example of, of them doing the same thing. However, um, you know, the, I think there's definitely there's definitely a role for it, uh, depending on the on the use case, of course, um, and and con, you know the users, uh, be it corporates or consumers, will determine whether they you know they, they adopt any of that going forward. If you're faced with a, a commercial bank liability or a central bank liability, if I can understand the difference between that, I'll probably gravitate towards the central bank liability simply because of the the risk nature of it and the guaranteed nature of it. If the commercial bank one is more convenient, I may sort of give up a little bit of risk to, to, for, for, for convenience, but those are all economic calculations that we'll have to make in the future. I know that Accenture, and you have mentioned this in the beginning, is not only working on CBDC, but also on digital assets in general. So can you share some of the plans you have and the role you foresee Accenture playing in the digital uh, assets or tokenized assets universe in the future? Sure. Um, well, the whole space, I, I would say, uh, you know, we, what we look at is sort of the global, I mean, uh, you may have seen some presentations that I've given uh, in the past, but we look at it from a global token economy perspective. Um, and, and the token economy, of course, has a, a very strong cash component because it's the, I would call the, oil in the engine, um, but the things that we're moving around in that engine are a number of uh, assets, um, be it tokenized, you know, tokenized bonds, securities, commodities, or what have you, um, or art, or or NFTs, yeah, who knows what the, you know, what, what the future holds. Um, however, um, those are all part of, uh, you know, this again, this global token economy and where we see a number of these things coming together. And we, we are playing our role. Our role is, is, is looking at it from an end-to-end -end and, and a comprehensive perspective. We see banks looking at issuing digital assets. We see banks looking at custody, customers' digital assets, be it crypto or what have you. Um, so the, the, the space is maturing and changing quite quickly. And I think all of these things are converging and coming together. And I think, uh, again, CBDC is the oil on that engine, but the engine is really uh, sort of what we what we assign value to. 
uh, and what we sort of hold as our assets, and those are becoming increasingly digital in nature, um, and they will inevitably, you know, include things like uh, you know digital digital uh, current uh, currencies, but also uh, securities and bonds and other types of digital assets that we attribute value to. I think this is also where uh, where the future will evolve uh, is evolving into. I think for all of us to, we really need to be paying attention to this. Um, and and CBDC is what I would I would call sort of a key leading indicator that this is where the market is transforming into. It's a, one of the first stepping stones uh, that we need in order to enable it. Um, and hence, you know, this journey is a very long journey, uh, and we're only at the very beginning. John, thanks a lot. Time is flying. We are already 45 minutes in. That was uh, really, really interesting. Maybe as a last question, where can people get in touch with you? And also, where can people find more information about Accenture's endeavor in the digital asset space? Well, we try to publish things as much as we can on our website. So you can always go there. Uh, we tend to have a lot of uh, you know the latest uh, white papers and material that we publish um, and we post that out. We also are, you know, obviously from on LinkedIn and Twitter, we tend to, you know, broadcast a lot of our, our activities. You can follow me. Um, I can uh, I can also, you know, reach out to me directly there and I can I can provide some more information. Um, and um, that's probably the best way to, to do that. Great. Then also thanks from my side, uh, John. It was really a pleasure to talk to you today. I also uh, yeah, really learned a lot. Also, thanks for sharing the, the insights uh, you gained with Accenture. And now I'm also really looking forward to the, the uh, yeah, new announcements to expect in the next uh, near future about Accenture's uh, endeavors in the digital money space. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. And I look forward to uh, keeping in touch and, and please feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.